are here with another episode of Phil and Michelle's Happy Hour. And this time for Happy Hour, we are joined by Kim, Jim Kowalski. Kim Kowalski. You know, Jim That's Kowalski. I know. We're not there yet. It's like <laughs> noon. Okay. All right. So president of Restoration Affiliates and also Kowalski Construction. And Restoration Affiliates has been growing a lot and is a great place for people to get involved that are trying to stay more of the independent route. Um, so I'm going to toss it over to you and have you introduce yourself and share a little bit about your background. And you've been in the industry for a while. So share about yourself. All right. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Um, as you mentioned, I've been in the industry for a while, 44 years uh, next month, actually. Um, despite my youthful appearance, I always <laughs> say uh, I, we're, we're a third generation restoration contractor. And uh, my dad started the business in 67. So we've been for, around for a while. I'm second generation with my brother. And then we've got uh, my son and son-in-law are third generation, then been with us, I think, 16, 17, 18 years, been for a little while now. So um, we are uh, been around for a while and plan to stick around for a while. And my involvement with Restoration Affiliates, uh, this is my fourth year as president. And um, the organization's only 11 years old. And as you mentioned, kind of an alternative to those that might be looking at mergers and acquisitions, something else that they can be a part of a larger network than they're able to provide on their own without having to sell their business because we're all independently owned and operated. So 1967, right? Is that what you said? Yes. So it's not 67 years. So th there wasn't much of an industry at that time. So you would, I mean, exactly. like serious pioneers. And, serious and pioneers. when I tell people we started in the restoration industry, there wasn't much of an industry back then. I mean, we talk about it being fragmented now. I got to take you back a while where there wasn't anything. There was no magazines, right? Of course, all pre-digital. So there was none of that. There was, it was the Lone Ranger out there, to be honest with you. Yeah. And we focused on that. My dad got into the cleaning and the restoration side of things. And that's what we did. And back in the day for years, I tell people, oh, you know, somebody in restoration in Phoenix. I know him. No <laughs> question. I know him. I can't do that now. It's my brother. Yeah, I right now there's so much consolidation, mergers, new companies coming in that it's hard for us to even stay on top of who our competitors are and what's happening in the marketplace, let alone know what's going on. So, so one of the things I'm gonna um, I want to clarify something. So that's a very very long run in restoration, and they say most businesses fail in the first three years. Right. I think once you make and it transitioning to, 10, to the next yeah. generation. Not a very well, the good third percentage. generation almost always fails. Right. So it's good to see that there's success there. What do you attribute your your longevity and success to? What are what are the kind of key elements that would take you from here from there to here? So a couple of things I'd like to share with you. When I was really young, and I remember going out on a large house fire, it's like my first big job, right, with my dad. And we got there, and I was so excited to start measuring and taking notes and taking photographs with a Polaroid camera um, <laughs> that I was just eager to go. And my dad walked up to the homeowner and he started having a conversation. And I was getting a little antsy like that. We, we got a lot of work to do here, you know? So after, I, and this was my dad. So he did we, what he was going to do and he completed. And then after I said, well, we got to get, we got to get after this job. He said, that is the job. He said, taking care of the customer is the job. And he goes, the rest of this stuff is just what we do. And so I was like, okay, I missed the point, right? I was focusing on the restoration for the job, but really we're taking care of the customer. And that's what that's one of the things that we've always tried to focus on. The second thing is culture is I tell everybody, this is how we are. It, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It might be different than what you're used to, but if you don't fit our culture, it's not going to be successful for either side. So we are hyper-focused on the right culture. And again, I'm not saying it's right and wrong. It's the right culture for our organization. We've taken a lot of effort to put a group of people together that we think worked well together. And if you bring somebody in that doesn't fit that, it creates more problems than it helps. And so we're really, I tell people jokingly, maybe not so much for those that work for us, we're harder to get hired on than the government because we go through interview after interview and test after test but when we find somebody and we bring them on, we feel like we really have a good chance of making it successful. And we want it to work for them. We do, when somebody says, well, I'd like, I'll give it a try. Wrong answer. I, I don't want you to give it a try. I want you to come and say, we really think this is a good opportunity for us. And I really want to work for this company. Now we've got a good opportunity to make 
a success for them and make them a, a, a contributing member of the team. And that's what it's all about. So, so a couple, I'm going to clarify a couple of things. So the first one, I want, I'm going to ask you a do, two questions okay. and then you can. I might have to up. ask you to okay. repeat the first one. I got short Maybe. attention span. Uh, <laughs> so the first thing is what, what does culture mean to you? How do you define that? Cause it's, you know, everybody talks about culture, but maybe it's different to everybody else. And the second thing it has to do with the hiring and going through that process. I mean, I can ask you two questions, but I'll, I'll ask you at the same time. Uh, so in the hiring process, in today's world, it's really hard to find people. Okay. And if you take those extra steps, are you losing people because of that? So, so you can, whatever order you want to take those two questions. I'll take the second one first. So lo one. losing people isn't necessarily a problem because we've been doing this for so long that the people that are there are a good culture fit for us. Sure. And so one, they've got to have passion for the industry. Um, if they don't feel passionate about what we do, they typically doesn't work out well for them. And you're right. We screen a lot of people and it's frustrating because when I've got project managers that just need guys to swing hammers or whatever, they just are looking for bodies. But when we do that, we never found that it to be an effective use of our time. And it's too hard on the candidate, bring them in for yeah. an opportunity that, that doesn't work out. doesn't make sense. So when we bring somebody in after our whole process of going through the background, we do team interviews. So if you're on my team and I'm interviewing a candidate, you now are going to interview that candidate and I'm not going to be in the picture. I'm going to be out. Right. And then you get the opportunity to give some feedback and it also buy in, right? Because we want somebody to come in and we want them to hit the ground running as fast as they're able once they're trained and all that. But I want the team to feel like they're invested in this. Yeah. That we all felt that this was a good decision and a good hire and that they had input in it. And when that happens, now we are all helping them, the new candidate, to become successful within the organization. Was that both questions? No, I yep. think I forgot the first no. one. Define culture to you. What oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody talks about that, culture, that right? That was an interview trick, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everybody talks about culture. And what, when we, one of the things that we look at, and I'll tell you a quick story. Um, when my son came home from kindergarten, he was so excited that he wanted to play soccer. Well, I didn't play soccer growing up. It wasn't popular back in my day. And so he was like, and I want you to be the coach. And I was like, me, what do I know about soccer? I'll be the assistant coach. I can't be the coach. I learned that you don't have to know anything to coach kindergartners soccer. But I went through these classes and I did assistant coach for the first year. And then I became the coach. And one of the things that I found, I could coach the boys. It was a boys team, but I couldn't coach the parents because the parents all wanted their little Johnny to score a goal in Saturday's game. Yeah. Well, I needed players in every spot. And so the kids would fall into that a little bit. I want to score a goal. Coach, I want to play, score a goal. So I came to practice one day and I got all the little kids around. I said, Coach Jim's got a great idea. You're going to love this. Gather around. They all came up and I said, today's game, I'm going to put everybody in the goalie. We're all going to be goalies today and nobody's going to score on us today. And I let that sink in for just a moment. <laughs> and the kids looked at me and finally one little brave boy kind of raised his hand and said, but, but Coach Jim, but how are we going to score a goal? I said, you know what? Coach Jim didn't think about that. He's yeah. absolutely right. That's it. Everybody out of the goal. We're going to put everybody up in the forward position. We're going to be scoring goal after goal after goal. And I stopped. And one of the little boys said, but won't they score on us? And I said, we need goalies. We need blockers. We need forwards. We need... And then I went around and I said, what do you, I'm the best kicker on the team. I said, okay, I need you. You're my blocker, right? And I got everybody feeling good about their position and their contribution to the team. And it's no different in business. We think differently for different positions and different roles have different gifts. So I've done almost every position in Kowalski as over the years, right? Sure. And I started as a kid cleaning the equipment. So I do a few things really well. And there's other jobs I can do, but I got other team members that do it better than me. So I have to have an appreciation for what they bring to the table, even if it's different. So I've got bean counters that cannot sleep until they find that three cent error. And they're so excited to find it. And I'm like, it's three cents. I don't care. Right. On to the next thing. But I need those people in the organization and I need them to understand their contribution. And I need other people to do that as well. So for us, part of the culture is the the respect for each other and what they all bring to the table as a team. We're effective 
individually, we're just individual performers. Yes. And so that's what we really try to push there. I love that story. My latest publisher's note was out with my little goalie and the lessons I've learned from him. So, oh, and it wonderful. has to do with teams and culture and putting people in the right places. So that is a great lesson. I'm curious in the decades that you've been in restoration, what's the same? So much has changed over the years, but what's still the same from when you first started at that first fire job or whatever? So I, that's a great question. And I, we learned this the hard way. My son experienced the house fire at his own home. And uh, it was a bad loss. And we had been in the restoration business for many, many, many years. And then it happened to somebody close by. And when we went through that experience, he came to us as the leadership team. He said, guys, we got to make some changes. He said, we do a good job, but we don't do a great job. And he sat down with us and he shared with us from a homeowner's perspective what it's like to go through something like that. And we sat there and I was embarrassed that I'd been in the business for years and years and years. And I felt like I was hearing it for the first time. So what hasn't changed is that the customer is still the customer and they're dealing with it, whether it's a business that's not emotionally attached to something or a homeowner that is, they're the ones that have to deal with it. And we've got to look at it from their perspective as opposed to ours. And, you know, part of that is, I tell a lot of the clients, I'm going to be like your father. You don't want to make these decisions right now, but I'm going to push you gently, but I'm going to push you. We've got to get these selections made early because you know what? If we wait too long and then you really want that particular selection and it's not available, you're not going to be happy. But you don't realize that maybe there's an issue with getting that material. So if I kind of guide you and you don't want to deal with that right now, but I kind of force you into it in a gentle way, but I've got to be firm. Then at the end of the job, you're going to be happier with me. So I get their agreement up front that that's how I'm going to operate. And then I've got that now that I'm a grandpa, I got that grandpa thing working for me. They, they let me do that. And so um, then I can get what they need ultimately by satisfying what we need and what we know that they need, even though they don't know it at the time. Uh, so a couple of, I listened to it was either you or your brother speak at some at some conference somewhere. Wasn't at a bar. They all run together a little bit. You had mentioned, I mean you can clarify if it was you or not, but had mentioned in your business you had 33 measurements every single day you were looking at. And and uh, my my first thought was that's kind of overwhelming. Yeah. Like how do you because there, <laughs> there was a a book that I read once and they talked about measurements and they said if you choose to measure something, you should therefore manage it. So are you looking at 35 different things and are you managing 35 different data points every single day? And what does that look like? And what does that do for your business? The great question. As an organization, somebody's managing those data points and helping them to understand that beyond just what the numbers are, but what triggers those numbers. Uh, somebody once said that you can run your business by the numbers. And, and I don't believe that. I think they're important. But what's the story behind the numbers? What did it, what caused it to do that? That's to me where I think the importance is. So myself and my brother, we look at the numbers, but we don't manage the individual numbers. But somebody has ownership for those group, a group of numbers. And collectively, the entire leadership team looks at it, albeit they'll focus on their numbers more critically than they will on some of the other numbers. But it's amazing how the questions can come up. And somebody from a different department will say, why did that happen? And when they're in tune with their numbers and they come back with an answer, it breeds confidence. Oh, they got that. They know what's going on. They know what's impacting that. There might be some challenge back and forth a little bit. Hey, how do you know? And what if it's that? Maybe it's something else. And we do that. But it gives us the confidence that the numbers are being monitored and managed. And then we feel comfortable. So we try to make it as simple as possible, right? One of the guys on my team, he wants colors, right? Green is good. Yellow is maybe not so good. And red is bad. Colors, graphs, whatever it is to make it easy, but then allow you to, I want high level review and then dig deep if you need to get to it. So we have a lot more numbers behind the scenes that you can go down and take a look at. But if you try to monitor too closely, too many at the top, it's easy to get lost in the numbers and not fully understand them. There, so one of my consultants, Ken Tucker, he has this philosophy that somewhere in the numbers lies the truth. 
you can lie a lot about about what's going on in your company, but until you look at the numbers, the numbers are going to tell the story. Right. And if you don't have good numbers, you don't know the story or you don't know the truth. And so I think that's just a good point in knowing that people need to be accountable to those things. And if you don't, if you just the owners are looking at the numbers and the leadership team isn't, you don't educate them on what to watch for. And so it's a great opportunity to get the entire team looking at the numbers so that we all better understand the business and what happens. And so when we say, well, we had a spike here, but here's why, or this dropped down, but here's what happened. And then we can all understand because it's human nature. This is what I need, but what good does it if business development outsells, uh, brings in opportunities that sales can handle or sales brings in more opportunities than production can handle. So yeah, we, we want to think about our own areas, but if we don't think of it in terms of the context of the entire organization, we're missing the point. And so I tell you another quick story. Uh, we really got inundated. We had a lot of uh, job opportunities and I had two BD candidates that worked directly for me that I knew could help in operations. So I sat down and I talked with them and I said, hey guys, you're working BD, doing a great job. We need help in operations. Would both of you guys be willing to pitch in and help run some jobs in the short term for us? Without hesitation, they both said yes, which was awesome. I went to my to my uh, operations manager and I said, I got two candidates. And he's thinking, oh, come on, I, I need, I need, I need operations people. I said, these guys can do it. I get a call from this fella late at night. Not common to get a call from him at night. I'm like, oh boy. Hey, Ron, what's going on? He says, I can't believe it. These guys are awesome. And he said, I thought you were just kind of giving me, you know, so, and he said, there were one guy ended up staying. He's still there, works in operations today. And he liked it and he stayed with it and he does a great job for us. We've got a perfect role for him. And he helped out. And the other one came back after we kind of stabilized thing and is working on the BD team. So it, you've got to work as a company together in order to, for the betterment of the company and not just focus on our individual departments. I've got uh, just to, the opportunity when this platform to talk a little bit about RA, Restoration Affiliates. It's affiliates, not alliance, yes, affiliates. Affiliate. And what value that brings to member companies and why companies should consider it if they haven't heard about it or don't know what you guys do and and that's a great point because as i look around the room there's a lot of household names in in the room we're probably not one of them right uh we all know ourselves but people come by the booth and they're like uh what do you guys do and so for us companies have been working in peer member groups like yours for a long time helping each other out and through that affiliation we would refer work to each other hey i know a guy that needs some work done in your market. We do, and we've been doing that for years. Fast forward to all this mergers and acquisitions, the consolidation that's happening in the marketplace. And now you've got the independent restorers like us going, well, wait a minute. Um, I've got all these large regional players, large national players in our market. We're the, the largest player in our market. But outside of my market, I'm just one guy, right? So we thought we need to come together in a different format than what's been tried before. We don't want it to be a, a tier level program. So every member in Restoration Affiliates is an equal owner of the parent organization, mm -hmm. which is a little bit different than what's been done in the past. And so if I bring a company in and recruit them to become a member, I get one vote, they get one vote. I gotta be really sure that that's gonna be a, a good member for yeah. us. So it's like we talked about before with the culture. And because we're sharing best practices, because we're helping and allocating resources to the betterment of each other's companies, we gotta make sure that we don't feel threatened by that. Yeah. And that we realize that if we all work better together, then it's stronger for the organization. So when somebody is thinking about using one of the bigger companies nationally or regionally in another market, I've got an alternative for them. It's when my customer, I don't want to work it with my competitors there, but I gladly refer them to my restoration affiliate companies. Okay. Before we wrap it up, we always ask for a story. We oh, need a good. fun story, a fun job, a big memory. I mean, we've had some interesting stories over time, wine cellars and 
other interesting stories. Ed had a really interesting one. Yes, Melted Santa Claus. That was one. So Jim, uh, thank you. See, keep it more PG than Ed kept it. Yes. Um, so okay, then. go wherever you want to. <laughs> Jim, go for it. Share a story. I have so many, but I'm going to start with this one. Um, so years ago, for your some of your readers or, or listeners, it's going to be hard for them to uh, to picture this date, but pre cell phone days, pre GPS. Using a map book, I get two calls for an afternoon. I'm going to go out and inspect. I call one fella. He's had a house fire. He's as calm as can be. I talk to another lady. She's hysterical. Whole house flooded. She's absolutely beside herself. So I prioritize him. I'll go take care of her first, and then I'll follow up the other. And he's like totally fine with that. No problem. I'll be here all day. Okay, great. So I show up to the first house. And the lady opens the door and I'm ready for the water to come flying out and there's nothing. Okay. We walk down in the end. She says, I'm glad you're here. Follow me, follow me. So we walk into the house no. and I'm not squishing on any wet carpet, right? And I'm like, huh. We walk down, turn the corner, go down the hallway, into the bedroom, still nothing. She goes over to the corner and she points and she says, there it is. I'm like, well... I guess I'll be early to my next appointment because this is nothing. So I learned to ask questions, right? I go to the next guy. I'm looking at my map book. I'm on the street now and I'm trying to figure out where the house is going to be. And I look up and there's no roof on that house. And I'm thinking, oh, I wonder if that's my guy. So I drive over to the house and I park out in front. And there's a man sitting in what used to be a garage in a lawn chair. There is absolutely nothing but burnt trusses above him. And I get out of the truck and I walk over and I say to him, well, this must be the place. <laughs> and he smiles and he says, I, I have a question for you. I said, what's that? You think I'll be able to stay here while you guys do the rebuild? <laughs> uh, no, uh, probably oh, no. not. So I learned what one person thinks is a disaster may not necessarily be what another person thinks. So ask questions, right? Wow. And I tell the people that take our leads, paint me a picture. I want to know describe it. Don't tell me we've had a whole house flood. Expl how many rooms are involved? How deep is the water? Give me a picture and go through and take the time because I tell them that little story. I'm curious what that woman would have made up of her water loss imagine? in her bedroom though. Like she was, even, even when I walked in, she was hysterical and walking down. And I, I was thinking to myself, like, what in the world are you? Because we see this all the time, right? And to us, it's no big deal. But to her, this was a big deal. Her whole house was flooded. Uh, well, Jim, thank you very much for joining us. And thank pleasure. you for all the stories and all the wisdom that you shared. And congrats on your tenure in the industry and all you do. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Enjoyed our time together.